Hello and welcome to today's devotion. We are in chapter 4 of Acts. We're going to start today with verse 13 as uh, we're looking and reading about Peter and John as they were arrested by the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem after they healed a lame man in chapter 3 and the interaction that they have, uh, the Jewish leadership of the time, and Peter and John. That being the case, Excuse me, that being the case, let's go into it, Father, or let's pray first. Father, thank you for your word. and pray that you open up our hearts and minds to be able to hear it, grab hold of it, and experience the life within it. May the words that we read today in your Holy Spirit open our minds to know your truth more, to understand deeper your truth, and to walk in the light of your truth. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Verse 13, when they, the they in this is the um, Jewish leadership, and you can go back a few verses in this chapter, it's very, but they were very specific. Um, chapter four is what we're in, verse five the next day their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem. And then it gives a list with verse 6. With Annas, the high priest. Caiaphas, his father-in-law, I believe. John, Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family. In other words, everybody who was in positions of authority and power were present. And the book of Acts makes that clear. It wasn't just a few, it was everybody. And so the, going back to verse 13, when they, this particular, these particular Jewish religious leaders, observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Now remember, these people that are recognized Jewish leadership, these are the people that 60 days or so ago completely tried to get rid of Jesus' movement by turning him over to the Roman Empire and having him killed. So this is fresh. This is contemporary events. This is not something that happened 10 years in the past. This is something that just recently happened. The tension is in the air. After they order them to leave the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin is uh, the group, the recognized uh, collection of all these different Jewish leadership factions, Sadducees, Pharisees, chief priests, etc. That makes up the Sanhedrin. Um, and after they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves, saying, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. That is very reminiscent of Nicodemus, who was also a member of the Jewish ruling council, who in the third chapter of John, comes to Jesus and at night so that he's not recognized, at least publicly, and says to Jesus as a, as a representative of the Jewish ruling council, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who's come from God for no one could do the miraculous signs you are performing if God were not with them. That was well known. Now, whether they admitted that or not, publicly, it's a matter of uh, discretion on their part, but they knew it. And so this is very reminiscent um, in verse 16. Verse 17, but so, that, but so that this does not spread any further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. There is a threat. Manipulation, intimidation. Those are two techniques of, uh, and deception. Manipulation, deception, and, and um, threatening. Um, intimidation. These are the ways that the enemy works. Not the spirit of God, but the enemy. 
And so they threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. In verse uh, 18 then, so they called for them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Remember, they are eyewitnesses, and Jesus in the Gospel of John tells them that they are going to be his eyewitnesses. This is not something that they are going to be, that they go to school to, to, to learn. This is not something that is book learning. This is something that they had experience firsthand. They are eyewitnesses. Now, the Holy Spirit takes what they witnessed, and as they proclaim it, the word of God goes out and people's lives are changed. But they themselves are witnesses, and therefore they are empowered by the Spirit of God, as Jesus said he would do that. He would send them the Holy Spirit to give them the boldness and power to testify. Verse 21 after threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them because the people were, were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For this sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years old. So this man, in terms of being healed, was healed after suffering from being lame for a long time. And a man over 40 is not a young child, not a young boy that can be manipulated into confessing something or professing something that may or may not have happened. No, his testimony is solid. So that brings us into verse 23. After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. This is Psalm, this is the second Psalm. Or another, the second Psalm says, against the Lord and against his anointed. They quote once again the Psalm, but now it's collectively. For in fact, this is verse 27 now, for in fact in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. This is proclamation. Proclamation is not, let me just back up a second. We live 2,000 years after this event. We have a whole history of church. And what's happening here is you have two, dur dur during the time frame that, Jesus, that Peter and John are actually doing this, is you have two institutions that carry with them authority to speak spiritually. With the Roman Empire, you have pagan priests. They are recognized by the government. They are recognized as having authority by the culture. You have Jewish leadership. 
that is recognized as having authority to speak on behalf of the God of Israel. And both of those two entities work together to thwart the work and the movement of the living God. This revelation that was given to the disciples was so profound, it is, it is earth shattering for them. They grew up recognizing the authority of the chief priests, even though they're, at this time the temple had been very corrupted by um, the influence of Rome, whether it's financial, whether it's despotism, the whole thing. But there was still an understanding that they were the recognized leaders. And so when they, the disciples, after the resurrection, realized that the God of Israel was doing what he had planned and and predicted he would do all the way back to Abraham, that all nations would come together back to the Lord through Christ. They couldn't help but proclaim it because nobody else would. And the Holy Spirit will always move among people who have humble hearts, who are willing to not only in their humbleness to be transformed by God's truth, but also to be obedient. The Holy Spirit always empowers people to speak on God's behalf. Now, we have channeled that and put that into pulpit preaching, but there's no pulpit in what's taking place here. There's no church building. This is uneducated, as I said, men that were basically testifying to what they experienced. And the Holy Spirit working through them was able to speak powerfully. This is the reality of God's chosen ecclesia, his church. It's not an institution in which one person or even two speak. It's a group of people, it's an assembly in which every single person being filled with the Holy Spirit is able to speak with boldness and confidence and have through that pro proclamation the Holy Spirit manifest himself in ways that are supernatural. And we see in verse 31, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. This is the uniformity that comes that the Holy Spirit uh, creates when he is able to freely move among the people and to move in a way that uh, their hearts are not only humble, but filled with his presence and emboldened with his power. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. I look forward, next time we'll pick it up with verse uh, 32, and we'll take a look at some of the characteristics of the first church as God was bringing them together. Until then, may the peace of God be with you, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.